So we recently received support from Research England, for example, to promote the uptake of, of transparent research practices across disciplines and across institutions. And that, that project is just getting underway at the moment. And that's really the point of intersection with what we'll be hearing about today, because that, that transparency in research allows for greater scrutiny, arguably can help to improve the quality of our research outputs, but also provides a mechanism by which we can recognize the rich and diverse range of intermediate research artifacts and various contributions to the research process that are generated across a broad range of disciplines. So although it's fair to say that um, the UK Reproducibility Network started from um, the life and biomedical sciences, if you like, our uh, ambition is to try to be as relevant as possible to as broad a range of disciplines as possible and to learn from those other disciplines because one of our guiding principles is that every discipline is doing really interesting things and doing certain things really well and we can all learn from each other uh, in that context. And this is one of those ways I think where we can have some very interesting conversations around how the infrastructure and ways of working that have been set up or are being set up to support that transparency in research can be really valuable across a broad range of disciplines and how we can learn from each other about the ways in which we need to recognize those different elements of the research process that uh, historically have perhaps not been as well recognized as they uh, as they should be and one of the reasons we're particularly excited about this workshop is that it is exactly that kind of quite unusual conversation across disciplinary boundaries that we're hoping to have and it reflects the fact that um, as a network we're supported by a broad range of stakeholders, including funders like the Arts and Humanities Research Council. So hopefully this will be the start of many more rich conversations, but I'm really looking forward to the rest of this afternoon. So at that, I will hand over to Mark. Thank you for coming again. Brilliant, Marcus. Thank you. And thank you for that um, uh, that prompt about learning from each other. I think that's absolutely critical. And I'm so pleased to see that there are 40 plus participants here. And I hope that we can do that this afternoon. My name is Mark Dinverno. I am a musician and I'm a computer scientist. Um, I co-founded the organization Prague to support practice research um, and I know that Oriana, one of our panelists, our first panelist, will speak a little bit about that so I won't say anything more now and I was lucky enough to be the co-supervisor on the Research England project um, which is a substantive report on practice research uh, exploring some of the issues of this workshop and James is the fifth panelist so I don't need to speak about that either. So what I would like to do is just uh, allow everybody in the order that was in the uh, uh, in the uh, advert for this so that would be um, Oriana and then I'm going to uh, speak uh, for Lauren Redhead and just say something about her because she's not here today and then we'll go around Bambo, Scott and James. So Oriana could I just ask you to say hello? Hi everyone, um, lovely to be with you all this afternoon. I'm here, I think in two capacities. First of all, for the last decade or so, and for many more decades than that, I'm afraid I, I, I've been working uh, within the context of practice uh, at the University of the Arts London, uh, and as Dean of Research for the last um, 12 years. Um, but I'm also here as chair of the Practice Research Advisory Group UK, which, as Mark said, uh, he was one of the, the, the great initiators of and co-founders, along with, I know Maria Delgado is somewhere here in the audience and she's someone who's, who's really pushed for us to, uh, to work more on these issues. Uh, so I think I, I've got these dual capacity, but I, I just wanted to say in terms of my own uh, subject interest, because I, I think it might help to understand how I locate myself. I, I was trained as an art historian, but I was an art historian who found text wanting a lot of the time. Uh, my, uh, my, PH, my own PhD was on um, ancient Mexican cultures where I did a lot of work on the hierarchical um, uh, distinctions being made between hieroglyphic and pictographic systems and the way in which text and image were perceived to be cultural signifiers of civilization. And so within that frame, uh, I'm particularly fascinated by these debates around practice research. Thank you. Thanks, Oriana. Bambu, actually, I've changed my mind. Can I come to you next? And I will introduce Lauren before I, we show her video a bit later. I think that seems more natural. Hi. Hello. Um, so I'm Professor Bambo Shrinka. I'm a professor of story at Baspar University. I have a very kind of mixed media, multi-platform approach to my research. 
Um, in terms of my artistic work, I was sort of trained as an interactive developer and I've done a lot of interactive theatre. So that kind of very conversational approach to research is, is key to what I do. And I'm hoping today, because it is a workshop as well, although I've prepared a presentation, I'm hopefully um, I'll be keen to generate as much conversation um, as I can around this, the topic. And I'm, I'm new to this network as well, so I'm also just keen to, to listen to what everybody has to say and, and chip in on those conversations. Great, thank you, Bambo. Uh, Scott. Hi there, I'm Scott McLaughlin. I'm at the University of Leeds and I'm a composer working in the music school. I come from kind of an experimental music background, so post cajun music. So I'm I'm particularly interested in the way this connects over with science in terms of epistemologies of, of how we do things and how we practice stuff. So I'm also very glad to be here talking in light of the Bully Sahan report, which I'm sure James will talk more about later on. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. James? Hello, it's um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm uh, James Bully. I'm an artist, composer, researcher. Um, I'm also, as has been mentioned, co-author of a recent report that was published in April surrounding practice research. And today I'm particularly going to talk about the second half of the report, which is actually the second discrete report, um, which explores how practice research can be shared. But just to give you a little bit of background about where I come from, um, so my PhD was in sonic art, so between fine art and music. I do a lot of installation work exploring uh, narrative within music, um, hybrid approaches to ecology, um, exploring installation works, music, live composition, um, spatiality of sound. Um, but in tandem with that, over the years, I've done a lot of work in archives. Um, I've been very involved in uh, creating the archive for the composer Daphne Oram and currently work on two other quite large archival projects. And so I have a kind of repository background as well alongside my artistic practice. Thank you so much, James. So um, what we're gonna do now is, is kind of go around in that order uh, and panelists have asked, been asked to speak for about five or 10 minutes. Um, and I suggest, unless there are any burning questions, we actually see that through uh, and then we will open the floor. And I hope that we will have a dynamic set of questions. I mean, what the, all of the panelists have said is how much they're looking forward to hearing what the questions are and to get, get that kind of dynamic debate going. So let's just, just rehearse some of those questions. How can we ensure that practice research is fully searchable and visible in the public domain? Are university repositories able to host the research findings of practice research projects run within or in collaboration with the universities in the UK? What kinds of practices can we design and share that allow for the most effective and efficient means of sharing the research findings of work in our area? How do we consider the ways in which the different disciplinary differences warrant different considerations in, dividing, in devising systems, whether they're technological or other systems, for archiving and disseminating practice research? So that was just a, sp a spur to try and sort of, you know, to, to think about what the panelists and what we might want to talk about. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over the floor to Oriana. Hi. Um, I, I think that uh, my interest in the documentation of practice based research grew out of frustration. Um, I've lived through several, um, first of all, the RE process and then the REF process as someone who helped pull my colleagues together to, to document their activities. And one of the things I was always aware of was the way in which uh, in certain subject areas, it was possible to just say, oh yes, here it is, take it. Uh, and in our subject area or the subject area of my colleagues, it was always incredibly complex to work out how one produced something with enough, um, uh, enough evidential documentation to allow a judgment to be made about its, um, its values. Uh, and then even after something, because we can't be governed only by mad things like ref processes, after those kinds of processes, where did it all go? Uh, having lived through lots of it, uh, I used to open up cupboards and find all these things in a cupboard. Uh, no one knew about what was going on. No one knew about the incredible work that I was aware of that my colleagues had been producing because it wasn't documented in such a way that it was communicable. 
to audiences who didn't know what they were looking for. Um, I said at the beginning that I, I, I'm a, I was trained as an art historian um, and people seem to think there's this big difference between um, certain subjects like art history and art and design in terms of how you should be articulating your research. But I was always convinced that the difficulty I had had, I think I was probably a bit dyslexic as, as, as a youth. I had to spend a lot of time working hard to understand what was called uh, scholarly apparatus. It might have been because I went to a comprehensive, I'm not sure. <laughs> Holland Park had a lot to, <laughs> probably a lot more fun to be at, but it, I didn't understand about grammar, I didn't understand about sentence structure. I very luckily got into university and then I had to learn all this ways, these mechanisms, these processes through which um, people could start to understand what I was trying to say. It, it wasn't innate, you know, it wasn't innate to, to the fact that you were trying to write an essay or an article. It was something you had to learn that these were, these were really quite boring, banal, uh, um, learnable activities that structured and put a framework around your ideas and allowed it to become transferable knowledge. And it was that desire to find a way to uh, articulate the work I saw going on around me as transferable knowledge uh, that led me to participate in the, uh, the setting up of um, uh, the organization that's been referred to already. Uh, We go. Is that working? Yes, that's working. Sorry, but it's not because I didn't start at the beginning. Hang on. There we go. Um, to, 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 to join colleagues in setting up something called the Practice Research Advi Advisory Group UK. Um, there are a lot of sort of contingent parts to this organization. It only exists through the people who work with it. Um, it aims to not be a, just for those working in fields such as art, design, communication, film, music, uh, but we've had a lot of interest from other disciplines, um, subjects such as translation and archaeology. Um, what we're looking at are ways in which people who know that they could not come to the knowledge that they are trying to communicate without uh, a complex series of moves that are practice based, uh, do not feel that that work is recognized or understood um, in terms of the effort that, uh, that it, um, uh, that's manifested within it. But also you could see it, and I was talking to, to colleagues at the AHRC last week, I was saying, well, to some extent, you sometimes let practitioners off the hook. As long as they can write about something in a very uh, eloquent way, you don't check whether or not the practice is really that good. Um, there aren't quite the same mechanisms that there are in some science subjects where there are traditions of how you document the empirical um, experimentation. Uh, and I felt, uh, and my colleagues on the steering committee of Prague felt, that we needed to start to talk to the sectors where this kind of issue was an important one about how we could come to some agreement that wasn't limiting, wasn't restricting, but offered a, 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 a scaffolding through which uh, these really interesting ideas could be um, communicated. So the main aim of Prague is this one I got up on the screen to reveal, position and promote the world leading research that takes place in the UK's creative and cultural sector. Going back to my reference earlier to, to Maria Delgado, she came up with this wonderful phrase about the ref graveyard. Uh, and I carry that with me all the time when I'm talking about this, that we have all this work which is not visible. And how do we make that more visible? Uh, and the aim is to do this through these uh, key um, points, through making explicit the contribution that practice research makes to industry and the creative economy, um, 
we can forget about the ref bit for now, <laughs> um, through building an evidence base uh, uh, that supports and develops a stronger research informed creative and cultural industry sector, and through producing a framework that can underpin the development of an archival infrastructure for something, possibly a web of arts that can be seen as a complement to the web of science. And we believe that through working together across our different uh, subject areas and institutions, uh, we can produce something which helps advise on the production of portfolios that can be seen as vehicles for developing creative models for practice research and for increasing the impact of that research. That we can help ensure the rich and varied partnerships that already exist between HEIs and industry that often um, understands issues around practice research far more than some within the HEI sector. And that it will help us to consult with subject associations uh, and creative industries bodies and other such organizations internationally so that we can find out what's happening across our partner areas and sectors and, and, and take the best things from those areas of practice. Um, we decided the first thing we had to do was to do this type of analysis, this consultation. And it was from that that we, um, we managed to uh, get funding um, from Research England to um, uh, begin the report that um, the wonderful uh, James, James Woolley uh, and his colleagues uh, produced. And, and, and you're gonna hear about that more later uh, in the discussion. Um, I'm sure there might be issues you want to ask about more in terms of Prague UK, but maybe a lot of those would be answered by just going on to the uh, Prague UK website. We've had to be fairly dormant during COVID because we're very much about getting out there and meeting people and doing live events, but we have various plans um, uh, to uh, hold events in the spring, um, pandemic allowing. Uh, and we're in conversation with the uh, research councils uh, about how we can help develop a wider understanding of the issues we're talking about today. I'll leave it there because I think you're gonna get, get a lot more from James uh, in terms of what came out of this uh, um, analysis of the position we're in now and the suggestions about where we could go from here. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Oriana. Um, I'm going to introduce Lauren. Uh, Lauren is a uh, senior lecturer in music and she sends her apologies. We were very keen. Lauren is an excellent speaker um, uh, in the realm of practice research uh, and she's currently in the air, so she really can't join us. But what she's done is she's made a video for us. It's about seven or eight minutes long. Uh, but I just want to introduce her and I'm going to do this verbatim from the website so I don't get it wrong. She says, my primary interests are in 20th and 21st century music. My musicological work focuses on the aesthetics and socio-semiotics of music, psychoanalytic perspectives on music, minority discourse, anti-aesthetics, materialism and notation. I am also a composer of experimental music whose scores are published by Material Press in Berlin and a performer of music for organ and electronics. Now, Lauren is going to talk in this video about some of the practical challenges that she has faced uh, and so we'll perhaps, if that's lined up to share, um, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to deliver this presentation. I'm sorry not to be with you in person or online today. Reproducibility has not been a prominent topic of discussion in practice research in the UK. As I see it, there are several and perhaps self-evident reasons for this. The first is the nature of the artwork itself. Since the outcomes of practice research include works of art, by their nature, these would seem not to be reproducible, even by the artists themselves, in the sense that copies would be non-identical to the original, or at least a tempor temporarily prior work, if one is to dispute the nature of originals. A second reason might be the ephemerality of performance events, where these are part of practice research projects. Central to this is the claim that performance only exists in its moment, a claim that has been made for music, theatre and dance, for example. And therefore, documentation of this moment is also something fundamentally different from the event itself. 
In this conception, the moment of performance is neither sustainable nor reproducible, except in the embodied memory of the performer. I do not wish necessarily to dispute either of these reasons, except to say that while these things may both be true of practice research projects, perhaps they imply a need to shift the discourse of evidencing aspects and outcomes of knowledge production away from singular uh, productions and towards processes in practice which could be sustained and reproduced, even where their outcomes are different on repetition. I could cite the work of researchers such as Ben Spatz and Scott McLaughlin in this respect. However, this is not the issue that I want to focus on in my talk today. A third issue experienced by practice researchers might be in the archiving and presentation of their work after documentation. The infrastructure that researchers encounter to support this is very uneven, as is the experience of researchers who wish to access information through this infrastructure. Here are a number of brief examples of what I mean. When submitting my PhD, albeit more than 10 years ago, I was advised only to archive the text and not the portfolio of works and recordings I had created, owing to copyright concerns. With my recent and current PhD students, on submission there have been difficult discussions about how not to make the text the central focus of the submission and how to integrate the practice in a way that will remain accessible in the future. I have seen and also examined elsewhere some very creative examples of this, but they have almost exclusively relied on personal websites maintained by the researcher as the mode of archiving. Longevity and therefore reproducibility are key concerns in work presented in this way. One might think of the precarity of digital humanities projects with web presentations. For example, the Notations 21 project in music that I frequently referred to and used as a teaching tool completely disappeared on the expiry of the web domain. The result of this is a very fragmented network of research documentation, and one that is often reliant on personal networks for the discoverability of research. It is also often focused on artistic products, even where these are not the only outcomes of research. So this is a hindrance to other researchers and to our students who may want to build on this previous research and it can lead to the isolation of the research and the researcher. It's led to the perception of black boxes, the REF graveyard, and the perception that research is only conducted for or in relation to REF, or it's only a framing of artistic practice that is otherwise not research. So one may still ask if this is merely an institutional issue or if it even matters. I'll give a longer example from a recent personal experience. I'm writing a chapter on electronic composition for a handbook. An interesting and key feature of this area is, in my opinion, work that has been done in practice research projects over recent years to revive and to recreate music of the mid 20th century. In writing about this topic, I wish to cite several projects, one of which was undertaken by my colleague at Goldsmiths, James Bully. I knew of this project both because of its national and international reach through a performance at the BBC Proms, but also because I had seen James present about it, including his research portfolio materials. However, when I went to our internal repository, where I knew these materials must be because of the REF requirement, I found I could not ask, access any of them owing to copyright issues. While frustrating, I could compare this experience to the material of the Hugh Davis project led by James Mooney at the University of Leeds which must also be subject to the same considerations, and yet in large part have been made open access. While James Bully and I found a solution to my problem, this was achievable because we were already in touch with each other. And from the images on these slides, it's not really clear what the difference is between these two repositories, but the Leeds uh, repository links all of the different uh, outputs together, and it also includes um, documentation like videos that you can watch and uh, that you can access through the repository. So what this episode demonstrates is that different researchers are receiving different advice and experience different levels of support in making their work open access. 
This seems dependent not only on infrastructure and institutions, but even on the efforts of individuals within those institutions. What is needed is a commitment for, and not just by researchers, to a system that makes stable open access possible for research outputs and materials easy, and copyright negotiation possible so that only aspects of this work and not entire outputs need to be redacted where really necessary. In my opinion, this should include a system of um, DOIs and move towards discoverability that could link these projects with WorldCat and other databases that researchers are used to using. It should be able to link the researchers or kid with their work across textual and practice-based formats. This should aim not only to support practice researchers and students in accessing this research, but to support all researchers. After all, the project in which I needed to cite James's work was a text-based project. I don't think that this is easily achieved, as it will require a commitment across all UK institutions that support research to make it possible. However, it's incredibly urgent, and so I hope that we can work towards examples and models that will make it possible for such institutions to create and adopt this. Thank you for listening. I'd now like to hand the floor over to Bambo, if I may. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I think I'll probably just start on by reflecting that when I was first uh, asked to do this presentation, I did panic slightly because I don't really see myself as um, a specialist in archiving. Um, but then when I thought about it and I read back on some of my work, I realised that a lot of what I do is actually about researching the process of archiving um, the writing community, the experiences of the writing community and the processes that they use, as well as reflecting on my own work. Um, but a huge part of what I do, it's really based within the community itself. So although I use technology a lot and I'm a big fan of technology, I think the first point I want to make is that for me, making things searchable is first and foremost about people. Um, and one of the key groups of people that I've worked with in the past are librarians, both public librarians and, and university librarians as well. Um, Benjamin Zephyr Naya describes um, libraries as the universities of the street. Um, and I think that um, the librarian works with um, writers and researchers right from that very first process of, of looking for and finding materials. And then in my own experience, I've worked closely um, with the Bastar University librarian, Miranda Barnes, who's just actually moved on to a project about archiving at another university. So I just really want to acknowledge the work of the whole community before talking a bit about my own perspective and practice um, as, as a creative practitioner. Um, so as, as authors and researchers, our finished works um, often weigh lighter than the fragments upon which we labour our entire lives. So I'm here paraphrasing Walter Benjamin, who was talking about the arcades project that he was still working on in 1940 um, when he died whilst fleeing from uh, Nazi, Nazi occupation. The archives was posthumously published as a work in progress, and it consisted of a series of indexes, observations and reflections on city life in, in Paris, in particular the glass covered arcades. The project has been described as a monumental ruin, carefully constructed over the course of 13 years. The theatre, as Benjamin said, of all of my struggles and all of my ideas. And I can relate to this because for the past six years, I've been struggling with others to document and archive the lives, experiences, working habits and, and um, environments of writers in the southwest of England in particular um, those working on the margins of, or, or fringes of, of culture. Simultaneously, I've also been reflecting upon and archiving my own creative process as a researcher, filmmaker and multi-platform storyteller. So for the presentation today, what I want to do is to offer some thoughts on this process in order to initiate discussion about the challenges of archiving creative practice. And I want this to be a conversation, so I do hope you'll contribute your thoughts and observations either at the end of the discussion or whilst I'm speaking in, in the com comment box. So um, another way in which my work is very much about archiving is my practice is often taken in the mould of a curator. And specifically, I'm a curator of cultures of literacy, writing and story. And as a curator, I'm interested in the ways in which people write, but also the structures of support um, around people as they write. 
for example, the technologies, the communities and the people which I've talked about and the institutions as well that surround that, that process of writing. Um, as a storyteller, I'm also interested in the words that we use to describe those processes and in the stories that we tell about our work. So to curate according to the dictionary is to select, organize and look at things or knowledge. But I'd like to enliven that definition a little bit. Historically, the practice of a curator derived from the more ancient work of the curate, who was vested in the care of people, both in this life and in their afterlife as well. And similarly, for me, curators today care about what is significant, important or interesting to other people. We care about the people themselves, but also about the knowledge and ideas that they contribute to culture. And writing itself or storytelling is also a process of curation or care because through writing, we observe the world and we record what we observe. The products, the books, the films, or the polished records that we produced often form the focal point of our work for audiences, um, but they aren't necessarily the most important point of the work itself. Rather, they're just one of many significant moments within an ongoing personal, cultural, and organizational system of storytelling or, or sign making. Um, a lot of my work is very much influenced by the phenomenological approach, and in particular Schutz, who differentiated between sign acts, the processes of signification, from sign obj objects, the products or outputs um, that convey certain meanings. And he suggested that every uh, cultural product is surrounded by a series of acts that connect the product to fat past and to future elements. These fringes, he said, are the stuff that poetry is made of. Um, more recently, Francesca Randall Short, a creative writing professor, has talked about the tissue of making to describe a similar process. Um, so the idea that creative research or creative writing is a process, not a product, is, is probably not new. And similarly, in fact, the ref defines all research as a systematic process of investigation that leads to new insights effectively shared. Um, so it's not a new idea, but I think the reason that we're here today is there's a, there's a lot less consensus or understanding in terms of how we go about sharing and making that process visible. Um, so some of the questions that I'm interested in around this topic is how do you go about archiving the fringes of poetry? How do you make visible, tangible or search, searchable that which is by its very nature ephemeral or tissue-like? And to what extent do you destroy the very thing that you're trying to make visible through the act of recording, naming, and classifying it? How do we go about ensuring that the record of the research isn't confused with the research itself, which is always a process of ongoing investigation? Um, and just as a, just a point of reflection as well, although um, like all of you here, I'm keen to see as much of the process um, recorded and, and shared, Writing and research is also about looking for what's significant. So there is also a question of what we choose to share and what we choose not to share, even in that process as well. Um, but one potential answer to this question that we often reach to is that what we need to do is to develop more sophisticated technologies and platforms for tagging, naming, and sharing our work. And whilst I think this is an important observation, as I said, I think it's very much about the people as well and the communities of support around it. So I've all already talked about um, the importance of librarians, but in a recent um, project, The Great Margin, I also wanted to make sure that I really reached to a wider poss uh, possible audience as possible. So I also used um, readily available technologies online, just such as Facebook, WordPress, um, Twitter, in order to reach a bigger audience as possible. But again, I paired up with other writers and artists working outside of the research tradition who were curating Facebook groups. And at the end of the research project, I gifted the, the site that I was working on to one of the partners that I've been working with. And that's enabled the project to stay alive and to keep visible within, within the public eye. So that's just a, one example of, of a solution that I, that I came up with. Um, so just to conclude my initial thoughts, for me, the process of archiving or making research visible is always ongoing. The act of archiving begins the moment we start our research and the output is only a midpoint, if that, in an ongoing process of sharing, indexing, and making visible what we do. Whilst it's important to continue to adapt our new approaches to new technologies, the people make up the community are um, perhaps 
the most important part of the system of support in helping to work our helping to make our own ongoing work more visible and shareable. Um, so they're my initial thoughts for now, and I can add, add to them a little bit later. Bambo, thank you very much indeed. Um, Scott, over to you. Thank you. And, and thank you everyone who's come before. I've been furiously taking notes. There's uh, loads of great stuff in here. Um, I am going to talk about, well, first I'm going to share, let's share something first, a couple of slides. So I'm a composer and I am going to talk about this from the perspective of someone who is a composer researcher in academia and about this aspect of searchability, also discoverability. But I want to start with, with this idea of, of, of how, well, as an example, how do I research? And I say research in my music composition, because of course, other people are going to research a little differently, but hopefully this uh, raises some of the issues that we're going to talk about and acts as an example. At any point when I'm dealing with composition, when I'm researching, there's always three intertwined aspects or at least this, I can, I can reduce it to these three for now, that there's the creation, the practice itself, which is essentially generating some sort of insights. There's the contextual aspect, the learning aspect, which is looking for similar insights, who else is doing things around this, who's done similar things, perhaps in totally different fields, perhaps in very similar fields. And then there's the aspect of sharing those insights, because in many ways, research isn't really research until it's something that can be shared with other people, until those insights can be got out there. So in trying to deal with all of these things, the, the generative and the contextual, the generative, the creative aspect and the context, the looking for other people who've done this, these things are constantly intertwined. They're always tripping over each other. I, I jump from one day being completely lost in my own material to another day furiously scouring the internet, trying to find other people who've done things even vaguely like this. I'm keyword searching, I'm digging around people I know, etc. And somewhere along the way, the sharing comes into it too, whether that's capturing things as I'm going, whether that's finding ways to wrap things up at the end, all of this is going on. And in thinking about searchability and discoverability, this is where I start to run into all sorts of interesting problems. Actually, they're not even interesting problems, they're boring problems because they're the problems that get in the way of you doing the work. It's, it's trying to find those other people, trying to find those contexts. Who else is doing this? Who's doing things like what I'm doing? Who's asking similar questions? Who's tried this thing before? All of these questions where, and I don't want to generalize and oversimplify, I'm not working in the STEM area, but my impression certainly of working in STEM is that a lot of this happens in written research outputs, papers, books, etc. If I want to go and find something, as Oriana mentioned earlier, the web of science, this is out there to go and hunt through. I can, I can search, I can keyword search, I can dig around, I can find the relevant people, I can find this stuff out. I know who else is researching, or at least who has written up their research. Of course, it's always going to be a few years behind. Trying to do that in an artistic world is so shackled by so many different issues, and not least of which is the problem of not having a similar way of sharing things, of not having something where I can just reliably go to more or less one or two places to find what it is I'm looking for. And part of this issue for me then comes down to essentially two things within the artistic world, as I as I see it from my vantage point, there seems to be within academia and academic composers as well, an imbalance on the focus on products rather than on the process, on the assumption in sharing that what people want to see is the product. In my world, that's the score or the recording. So what we have is that I'm hunting around trying to find things that might be similar, things that allow me to generate more insights, things I can compare against, things I can learn from. and what I have to do is go and dig around the websites of other people who I think maybe are working in a similar kind of area. So I'm already limited by the list of people I know who work maybe in a similar area or a list of people, well, it's a limited list already. So I go to somebody's website, I maybe find a recording, maybe not. I, maybe that recording is only a fragment of the piece of music I'm interested in. Maybe it's a poor rehearsal recording, although these days even the worst rehearsal recordings are still pretty good. 
maybe there's a score, maybe there isn't, maybe there are copyright issues around putting these things up, maybe there isn't, etc. Maybe there's a program note, but that program note has been written for a public audience listening to the music. None of these things necessarily contain the research and insights that I need to allow me to continue to do the work that I'm trying to do. So, and as much as, of course, I have a personal website myself, I put things up on it, I don't necessarily make it research facing. The fact that even even I would consider myself as somebody who was doing their best to get the research out there where the research is not necessarily embodied in purely seeing the score or listening to the piece of music. Sometimes it needs textual or diagrammatic or some other forms of information processing to get the research out there. However, even so, my own work is not is buried under all sorts of things. So if you go to my website, you will find recordings, you will find scores, you will find some small descriptions of things. But ultimately, if you want to find the research, you're probably going to have to go and find those half a dozen papers or book chapters that I've written that talks about it, locked behind paywalls in many cases, etc. So these two things, this, the, the focus on products, the focus on the outputs and not taking into account the process that's got there, and also not thinking about what does a research audience want to see out of this? How do I make the research aspects of this transparent and findable by other people who are interested in this research? These, to me, seem to be the two big issues along the way. And there are many other issues, and there are issues that come alongside with that, as the Bully Sahan report uh, has wonderfully and at length pointed out. Which brings me briefly to this idea of reproducibility. Hello, Reprodu Reproducibility Network. It's nice to be here. The, the idea of reproducibility is, of course, we've, we've had crises and all sorts of things over the last few years. But I think within the practice research area, as Lauren mentioned, it's not something that comes up as much, the idea of reproducibility. I think in some ways it's a different issue in practice research, partially because objective knowledge is not central to this discourse. I often... In classes where I teach composition, I often note to my students that I could give them all exactly the same material and exactly the same problem to solve, and they'd all find their own different ways to do it. Something that practice research and arts practice in general excels at doing is in not, not reinventing wheels and not making the same thing twice. I'm going to counter that by thinking um, of Reinberger's idea of epistemic things, and this passage I'm just going to read out comes from Michael Schwab's um, article experiment towards an artistic epistemology, where he quotes Reinberger by talking about how we should understand experimental systems as designed to be open. And experimental systems, by the way, is, is Reinberger's dis, um, description of how the process of, of how knowledge happens in particular forms of exploratory research. We should understand that experimental systems are designed to be open so that the deployed knowledge results in ruptures from which unexpected new objects relevant to knowledge emerge, which Reinberger calls epistemic things. Since they're organized around the unknown, experimental systems are very different closed systems of, for example, industrial production, where specific outcomes are anticipated and controlled. And this is something I see all the time in artistic and practice researches, that you have researchers who are looking to create ruptures, who are looking to, to find how something has been done already, but are now trying to find a new way through this, push past what's been done before, find another way around this, find another way to do something and see what can be discovered by trying it a different way. And of course, this is very difficult to do when you can't find who else has done it the same way or a different way or anything else. So this comes back again to that same problem of researchers not having the resources and the infrastructure or, frankly, the, the push, the will. And I don't mean this on a personal way, but the, the, the system doesn't reward composers and researchers making these things findable because so much is focused on the ref. We've already had reference to the ref graveyard, which I agree is a very perfect way of thinking about this. But even before we get to the ref and the graveyard, there's the problem of only thinking about- One minute, uh, One minute Thank left. You. Thank you. Only thinking about this in terms of how it gets to ref. It needs to be out there all the time. So I'll throw one other thing out there, just going back to the Bully Sound report that the key challenge for sharing practice research is discoverability, how it's often mooted that research is only as impactful as it is discoverable in the present day where the vast majority of research is accessed, accessed online, discoverability hinges on indexing. 
if practice research is not indexed by online discovery tools, and I've added in this part, and indexed as research, research audiences are unlikely to find it. And I think this is the key, one of the key issues. Just to close off, things that come up from the Bully Sahin report that I think are incredibly useful in this, the idea of a project item type that allows us to bring process and product into the same place and focus on what's useful is important. DOIs, of course, are great, but the work has to be done first to get the things into a place where we can link them to, to a DOI. What Lauren said about the Davies project, for example, and having a reliable and nationalized or centralized system will make this much easier and will give the energy to composers and researchers to make things be findable. Thank you very much. Brilliant, Scott. Can I thank you for having the timer on your slides so that I could um, uh, see when your 10 minutes are up? That was terrific. And also naturally uh, uh, segueing into uh, James talking about uh, some of these issues. Thank you, James. Great. Um, <laughs> I would like to spend time discussing, but I'm going to focus very much on talking about the reports here. I'm going to address a couple of small things right at the beginning, um, just so that hopefully they can be brought up later. So something that Lauren mentioned um, about uh, my own work, which I'm not going to talk about here, um, that was very, very interesting is copyright issues. Um, I just wanted to point out that there's a series of other additional things going on with that project that I think may be worth discussing as an example and that are exemplified in James Mooney's project. One of the big things there is to do with funding and research funding for practice research projects to enable proper documentation and what Scott talked about, which is the linking together of process uh, of, uh, documents and product all in one area in one place that can make it accessible. So I think we should probably come back to that and talk about that. Um, I think, you know, one of the driving forces here um, that Oriana pointed out really, really well was the desire to articulate transferable knowledge. And I think that's at the core of what we're talking about um, with making practice research able to be shared. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to quickly mention before I kind of embark upon this is very much in line with what Bambo was saying that I think for practice research and indeed any research to be shared, um, on there, there is a real need for academics and for research support professionals to understand how broad this community is of people that need to work together to make this happen. This is not just about academics formulating their work in a certain way. It is also not just about uh, research support professionals working in repositories and libraries doing all the work at their end. It, it is all of those people working together and working very closely together to solve a lot of these quite complex problems. Which brings me on to uh, the practice research reports. These were published um, on 1st of April this year. They're co-authored between myself and Dr. Sten Shahin, who unfortunately can't be here. I think she might also be on a plane somewhere on the way to Turkey. So um, I'm gonna talk on behalf of both of us. Um, these reports, and, and really I'm going to focus very much on talking about the second report, they're openly available, um, open access online, and I'll share a link at the end of this. But I wanted to just give you a bit of background about this to kind of add to what Oriana and Mark have uh, both said. So really the foundation of these reports comes from a couple of very clear questions. How does practice research enrich our ways of knowing and understanding the world, and how can it be shared? And the first report, they were published as two reports together. The first report is entitled, What is Practice Research? And I'm not gonna talk about that today because it's a, a very kind of different area to talk about. But the second report is about how practice research can be shared. So these reports, as was mentioned, they were um, commissioned by the Practice Research Advisory Group um, and funded by Research England, UKRI. Um, and they involved a huge amount of people um, who both us and I are very grateful to for masses of time, including our supervisors, some of whom are present today, who are incredibly patient and put huge amounts of work in as well. Um, I think there's a really important thing here that was mentioned by um, Stephen Hill, Director of Research at Research England, during an interview we did with him in 2019, where he said that, I think you could almost argue that practice research is in a position to be inventing its dissemination route for the digital era and can learn all the lessons about what's gone wrong over 400 years in written research communication, and actually get it right, rather than be stuck with a 16th, 17th century model that we're trying to fit into a different world. 
So what's really crucial here is to think that actually thinking through practice research as an area and how it can be shared effectively and issues of reproducibility and all the things underneath that actually allows us to kind of reinvigorate all areas of research. And practice research is in a very interesting position in that way because these routes don't really exist right now and we can found new routes to think through. So in terms of how these reports were made, just to give a bit of an outline, um, there were 62 direct participants in these reports, so a very large um, kind of catchment of people that we were talking to. Uh, we did face-to-face -face interviews with researchers and practitioners, university research managers, publishers, research support professionals, systems administrators. And this is, for us, Dan and I, something very close to our heart in the sense that we were actually involved in setting up the Institutional Research Repository at Goldsmiths. I've done lots of archiving and special collections, as well as us both being um, researchers and artists and curators in our own right. So we kind of sit on both sides of this. Um, additionally, there's questionnaires and survey data that underpins all of this and a very in-depth literature review, not just academically in, in terms of philosophy of practice research, but also technical standards for storage and preservation, all these sorts of things. We talked a lot with institutions like the British Library uh, on this kind of side of stuff. So, as I mentioned, I'm not going to talk about report one, what is practice research, but that is available online. Um, but what I do want to do is talk about some key terms. So one of the biggest things we encountered going through these reports and talking to people is huge variety of how people talk about practice research. Even the term practice research, there's practice led research, practice based research, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to retread all of that. There's lots of stuff about that in the first report, but what we came to is a kind of, um, summation of the kind of 60 odd people we talked to of how to talk about key things with practice research which hopefully will really help the field move onwards in these kind of discussions because it is important to have clear clear terminology that's not to say this stuff is fixed but it's all open for discussion but it's a move a step forward so first of all practice research this is an umbrella term that describes all manners of research where practice is the significant method of research conveyed in a research output What's very important here is this isn't discipline specific at all. And in fact, outside of disciplines, this still applies. So the term practice research is not capitalized and can be used across research fields, just like any other um, area of research. And this, this next term is very crucial in terms of what Scott was just talking about. So the research narrative, a research narrative articulates the research inquiry that has emerged in practice. In a practice research output, a research narrative can be conjoined with or embodied in practice. So I'll skip through these next ones, but these are just clarifications really where within the reports we talk about research types or fields, um, and that's practice research, and then an item type. And again, for many people running repositories, this is very important to have clarity around this when talking to academics. So examples of research item types include book, journal article, design, project, performance, etc. Compositional structure we talk about in the second report, and I'll mention that shortly, and formats, which uh, are file formats, PDF, zip, etc. So I'm going to take you very quickly through the second report. This is very much available for people to access. Um, so I will just go through the kind of headlines of each section of it. Um, so the second report is very much focused purely on how can practice research be shared, and it really goes into a lot of depth around that. Um, both technically and infrastructurally. And one very important thing to mention is this is only based in England. So there, it would be wonderful if the report could have covered the whole of the United Kingdom. And in fact, there's a, a very strong argument for a more global approach to this as well, because there's been a lot of interest internationally. So the first section um, of the second report explores structuring practice research. So this is, this is a kind of very important thing um, because it helps research be approachable to audiences, but it also helps on a technical functional level. Um, so we, in consultation with lots of people, came up with a guideline compositional structure. This is not something people need to adhere to. And in fact, they can break it down in whatever way they want and completely disregard it. But this is something that just allows people, if they need um, some advice and some reference guidelines for how they might want to structure a practice research output, this allows for that. So you have summary, abstract, context, research inquiry, method statements, and then this bit, which is crucial and people often get quite caught up on, practice, description of practice, or documentation of practice as a proxy. 
and then insights, discussions, ways of knowing, and conclusions. So this bottom line, also very important to be mentioned by practically everyone today, this is a big thing that needs to be moved on from. So practice research outputs are submitted to rather than created for research assessments such as the REF. And there is, a, there is a need for a cultural change in academia and further afield about how practice research outputs are thought about. So at that point, when you kind of benchmark your process as Bambo referred to and you say, this is the point where I want to capture something and put it out there, um, that shouldn't only be for the REF. And the place you put it shouldn't only be the ref assessment portal. So um, item types for practice research are, are very important and something that people often get very caught up on. Practice research outputs can be contained in any research item type. So this can include more conventional research item types like book or book section, but this can also be within an exhibition or within a journal article, a performance or a project. However, it is really important, and I, I can see on the list of people here that there are quite a lot of institutional repository people here. And having had this experience myself, it's important to realize that there is a real issue with item types other than books, book session sections, journal articles and conference proceedings being shared digitally online. It's very difficult to make them discoverable and interoperable with global research systems. And this is just a truth. This is the reality of the situation. And Many institutions are spending huge amounts of money trying to have every possible item type available for their researchers to support them. Um, and this is happening over and over again at different institutions and is a conversation that needs to be had. So within the reports, one of the things that emerged um, within lots of different conversations was the idea that Scott mentioned of a project item type. Now, this would allow many different um, documents um, and documentation of practice uh, as a proxy to all come within one item. Uh, very similar to the James Mooney item that Lauren mentioned. Um, and this is something that needs discussing and exploring. Um, brief mention of additions could also be employed for this project item type. Formats and metadata, there's a lot of detail in the report about this. I'm not gonna go into it too much here, um, but the differing of all the different file formats for practice research outputs that's happening at the moment, and the same as um, what I was just talking about in terms of item types, that's causing huge amounts of problems for institutional repositories and research repositories more broadly. And limiting that and trying to come up with some recommendations would be very useful for people. For instance, doc, docx, more of MP4, all of these different things, someone has to provide a technical solution for hosting them. And actually there, are, there can be some standardization that happens here and the project item type may well help. Peer review, this was a very, very, um, complex and difficult area of doing the reports and really is a big open discussion that needs to happen across the community. There's a general consensus that peer review is of huge importance for practice research. It provides editorial assistance for researchers. It assures um, that reproducibility is, is possible, that things can be shared, they can be preserved, that they'll be interoperable. These are some of the things that people don't really think about with peer review, but are, are a hugely important part of the process. It also ensures that practice research can meet the standards of the research community. And so audiences and funders particularly can build up trust in this overall body of, of research outputs, fund it more, access it more, champion it more, all of those things. Clearly peer review systems for research publication, which are very much focused on traditional uh, empirical scientific models do not function well for a lot of practice research. Um, I, I didn't hear any argument against that um, all the way through. And um, there are very few examples of good practice. Um, ben Spatz's journal, uh, Journal of Embodied Research is one, the Journal of Artistic Research uh, run by Henk Borgdorf and others, um, is another one. Um, and there are a few other kind of examples floating around, but very much this isn't something that's broadly happening. So given everything I've just said, and also kind of drawing from what other people have just said, there's a real need to explore um, how peer review can work for practice research, um, and also how hosting can work. So where do, where do these things go? Um, and that led us to think very deeply about an idea of an open library of practice research, which could be one route towards integrating peer review and hosting practice research. So 
obviously, as many people here will, will know, there, there is a really big challenge in storing and preserving practice research outputs. Most, most practice research is completely inaccessible, as Oriana mentioned, and Mark. Um, issues include a lack of kind of a collective item type that's been agreed. Some places have portfolios, some places have projects, other, other places have all sorts of different terminology for this. They have different metadata standards, different file formats. It's, it's very complex at the moment how things are. Um, and there also needs to be a kind of generally agreed set of guidance and standards around this. And there needs to be people thinking about this and working together to draw together the community to work on this. As I've mentioned, institutional repositories and generally research support professionals are really important in, in this discussion. Um, and I, th I think it's fair to say that over the last 20 years, there have been many situations where I've been at conferences uh, on an academic side talking about practice research where there's been barely anyone from institutional repositories and vice versa. And without having all those people together discussing things in a, in a really kind of pragmatic and careful way, um, there won't be proper progress. So um, one of the other things that the report finds is that um, the feasibility and potential of an open library of practice research is vital in terms of um, thinking about how research outputs coming from practice uh, researchers can be harvested and hosted. Um, and really there, there needs to be a whole kind of scoping project around this and, and the community needs to discuss this in a lot of depth. There are, there's a lot of detail in the report that sort of backs this up and suggests potential routes that would be really useful in terms of exploring this. Um, as has been mentioned, DOIs, ORCID IDs for researchers. There is a brief mention of metric tools and citation indexes, which don't tend to work very well for practice research, but might be something to explore in the future. Um, one of the things we found is that open access tenants have actually been very, very powerful with practice research in terms of making some of it available at least. Um, and this may be something that would, would be quite an important kind of cornerstone of how practice research as a community moves forward in the future. So um, I'm just gonna kind of briefly just outline the conclusions of this second report. So- James, a couple, a couple more minutes for that. Um, yeah, give you enough yeah time that's fine. Yep, yeah, perfect. Um, the fundamental thing that the reports find, both of the two reports is that um, there needs to be a practice research advisory body, uh, an independent body, um, which could be PRAG and could be an expanded version of it, uh, that is looking at all of these issues. And it needs to draw together the community to look at some very specific things um, that will help everyone out ultimately in terms of uh, sharing this research. Because as Oriana noted, I mean, this really can't go on in the sense that there's this massive body of incredible research out there and that's not just a national thing that's an international thing and this research is not um it's not transferable this knowledge is not being shared to people because of a whole series of quite straightforward questions that all need solving and progressing so some of these questions um that will need to be explored are what are the most appropriate formats for the generation dissemination preservation and practice research is it possible to adopt the idea of this project research output item type across global research systems? So, for example, if you're a documentary filmmaker and you, you want to publish uh, a piece of um, practice research output about that documentary film, you could have a project output item type, which could include the film, um, a written research narrative or even a spoken research narrative, a kind of director's cut thing, and groups it all together under one item type that can be easily, easily shareable. Um, these discussions need to involve research support professionals, practice researchers, and crucially, as I haven't mentioned up to now, policy makers, and I could add to that funders, because without all of those people being involved, it will be very difficult to make progress. Um, there is a need um, to explore the feasibility for a new peer review model for practice research publication. What could that look like? I mean, this is a very contentious area, but it's very important to, to explore. So finally, there, there needs to be further reporting surrounding practice research and open access and thinking about how, um, how that works. So for example, taking Lauren's um, critique of the availability of my still point project. So that was actually, I put together that project for REF because that was a REF submission. 
and then immediately ran into an issue where the performance was uh, recorded by the BBC and they wouldn't let me make it accessible because of copyright. However, if there was an open access mandate on me when I was creating that project and submitting it to REF, I would have had to have structured it in a very different way to make it openly accessible. And I will fully admit that at that point, I had very little time. It's not part of a funded research project. It's an independent piece of research. So I did not make that piece of research presentable in a way that was openly accessible. Um, and that's something that I very much take from Lauren's comment there. And then as a fundamental kind of final point, um, there needs to be an investigation of the founding of an open library of practice research. So this would harvest and host peer reviewed practice research outputs. So what we mean there is, you know, it can harvest practice research from institutional repositories, from journals where it's been peer reviewed and bring it directly in. And this could be hosted somewhere like the British Library, for example, who we had conversations with this about this and would be amenable to this idea. Um, and also independent researchers, such as I am right now, because I'm not attached to an institution, could feasibly submit practice research outputs to um, this uh, open library of practice research as well. And then finally, there needs to be specific support for what happens in the future. And it is worth exploring using principles of open access within uh, the future of practice research. And all of this can come under the role of a uh, practice research advisory group. This is where the reports are. So I'm sorry, that was very quick, but I wanted to get through as much as possible. This is where the reports are accessible. It's on the British Library Shared Research Repository. Um, both reports are grouped together in one PDF file. And do feel free to be in touch with me if anyone would like to discuss anything sort of at length later on. But um, I look forward to the discussion very much. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much indeed, James. Uh, just to, in the interest of fairness, Oriana handed James five minutes uh, earlier before when we were negotiating. So that's why you got a little bit more there, James. Um, I suggest now to give our panellists a little bit of a break. Can we just take a four or five minute break, allow the panellists to get some water uh, and whatever's needed, and then we will fire into the questions. Marcus and Will, when people ask questions, is it by voice? Can we, I think it's just nice if people can speak. Is that something we can set up in the Zoom? But please, panellists, just have your five minute break and we'll come back with questions. Please um, don't go away, everybody. Mark, um, yes. when we come back, there's a couple of things that came up that I just would like to add of to if that's OK. All yeah, right. we'll, start, we'll, we'll, come, we'll, we'll start with you, Bambo, and perhaps any reflections that the panellists want to make and then we'll go into the questions. Great idea. Let's do that. Okay, bye. I, I might do that. Which of the panelists would like to reflect um, on what they heard from the other panelists? Bambo does. Um, Scott, Oriana, James, um, before we go into questions. Marcus would like to say something. I was just really struck by something that Scott said about focusing on the process, because I think that's a real part of, of what yeah, where the discussion is going in other disciplines. And the word, as I said at the outset, and as you alluded to, the word reproducibility is um, unhelpful sometimes because it means different things to different people but equally that can be a strength because you can use it to mean whatever you want it to mean and, and I think whilst you're quite right that in many disciplines um, you wouldn't expect two researchers to arrive at the same conclusions with the same source material and even the same process I think having transparency to that process allows for the process to be reproduced if you like and then those points of disagreement or divergence to be identified and that's really helpful and not possible if all you focus on is the is the end product. And that's one of those examples of something that I think is actually common across a very broad range of disciplines in terms of something that could be valuable. And in terms of what we can learn from each other, I think there are um, scholars in the social sciences, the arts, the humanities who, who deeply understand the subjectivity inherent in the research process in a way that quantitative researchers, for example, don't because there's a sort of assumption that because we use numbers that makes us objective, which of course isn't true. Um, but we don't really engage with that as quantitative researchers, that subjectivity as much as we perhaps should. So there are a couple of things there that I think link back to the reasons that I said I was excited about this workshop in the first place. So I just wanted to emphasize those. But that's that's great, Marcus, that not only in terms of the content of what you've just said, but also the fact that you put your hand up and I knew that you wanted to speak. And so that's what we'll do. And I noticed that, Liam, you have put a question into the into the box. I'd be it's just so much nicer hearing people's voices than me reading it out. So if we could do that, Scott, you'd like to come back, then I'm going to have Bambo and then I'm going to um, see if Liam wants to come in. 
Thanks, Mark. Yeah, and and thank you, Marcus. Yeah, I completely agree that it does mean different things across different across different disciplines. I think the point I would emphasize again is that is that transparency issue, and it's something that, at least from my standpoint, I don't see enough of happening in the arts. The transparency about what is happening in the research, what is considered to be the insights, how are things compared with each other, etc. Not necessarily to reproduce in the way that might be valorized in certain disciplines, but rather to reproduce the paths that allow divergences to happen in a creative and useful way. Great, Scott. Now over to you, Bambo. Yes. So, um, well, on my part, this was all um, unplanned, but I was really pleased to see a lot of resonances across the presentations. And I am, I'm 100% behind um, the project to um, make processes more visible through archiving. But I, I want to just emphasize a little bit more because I don't think I went enough into it into exactly what I mean by care and community as well, because there's a little no note of caution that, that comes with that. So we often assume that communities are these wonderful, cohesive places with, with one perspective or one point of view, but often even within a particular community, there's a lot of differences and different points of view. So you reminded me, Scott, when you talked about the imbalance between the product and the process, even within the process, something that I've written about is that there's an imbalance in perspectives as well. And the most obvious one being between the researcher and the person that's been researched. And even though there's a huge move to try and break that down, you know, historically, there's quite a lot of historical violence in the gaze that we put on people as we're researching them. And it's interesting in the language that we use sometimes about it, that, that comes back in. You know, the idea of harvesting, for instance, although I, I understand what's been said, there's a potential danger in that. So particularly with the area that I work, where you're working with people who are, are, um, are writing or creating work on the margins, it's about trying to find ways where the people who you're um, co-producing research with, even though that they might not be official researchers themselves, have some say in terms of what is kept in the archive and, and what is left out as well um, and in some of the projects I did you can also sometimes assume you know I sometimes think of myself as someone who writes on the margins but if I'm working with different groups of people they might have certain vulnerabilities that I'm not aware of certain things that they want to uh, to keep out and so that has to be I think brought into the conversation about archiving is not only what we put in but where do we sometimes leave things out as well um, and there's a part of that as well that's also re related not only just to ethics, but also poetics as well. So they are, I talked about story and narrative as a form of archiving, but there are, for, for instance, within African culture, certain traditions of storytelling within which the stories themselves are quite subtle ways of archiving cultural knowledge. But that knowledge is deliberately kept oral, it's deliberately kept live um, so that it's only accessible <laughs> to a certain amount of, of, of people or just people who've been trained in that tradition. So there's certain delicacies there, I think, that have to be, you know, they're interesting from a poetic point of view, but also from an ethical point of view as well. Um, and then just a two other sort of smaller thoughts. We talked a lot about reproducibility, but um, one of the things I've noticed as well in the work that I've done is the importance of translatability as well. So often you're not only just shifting something from one platform to another, but to talk to a specific audience, you're translating that content from one context to another. And there's a certain amount of work that goes into that. And then just finally, James, on your com comment about journals and peer review, I just wanted just to reiterate how important that, that is. Um, I, I run a journal called um, Transnational Literature, and I've been trying to move it over to more, more peer reviewed creative work. I've been, meeting some quite surprising resistance from that, even within the creative practice community saying, well, we can't do that, which is quite extraordinary, really, given that we've got a huge tradition of um, assessing PhDs um, and we have to go through the whole reference as well. So there should be some understanding about how we do that. So I think that's that's a really important part of the project as well. But the most important thing for me is, is just thinking about that notion of care and thinking about what we what we choose to leave out as well as what we put in as well. Brilliant, Bambo. Now, I'm, James, I'm going to come to you as I think you're responding to some of what Bambo says, but Liam, rest assured, I will come to you with your question shortly. Um, 
but, but I think you pointed out some really crucial things there that I didn't really talk about too much that um, definitely have arisen. There is a, a forthcoming um, study being discussed of ethics in practice research that I think is very crucial. And we, we had to kind of pick our battles slightly within the reports of how deep you would go into something. But I think um, Scott has also mentioned somewhere in the comments, but ethics in practice research is so crucial and actually really lacking in terms of training for researchers. And there are really good examples to look at in other research fields as well, where we can learn a lot from that. Um, I also think this right to choose is re is very, very important. And it's, it's quite easy to be kind of unilateral when you talk in terms of explaining a report, say, and to say that this is how things should be done. But obviously, people have, the researchers have the choice, those involved have the choice. And that, again, feeds into that ethical thing. Um, a secondary thing I also really wanted to mention, um, I'm really glad you raised translation because it reminded me of one of the biggest things we came across is that practice research is currently completely unaccessible to a whole series of different groups of people, um, say for screen readers. It's pretty much inaccessible because people often choose to document their work in ways that just it's not it's not something they can access. And a lot of this can be dealt with within the peer review mechanism. And the two things kind of come together. And it's really important to think about diverse audiences for practice research, not solely your peer group who are all the same as you. And I think that's really important. And just to echo your uh, slight kind of foray into talking about translation, because that same set of issues of, you know, is this accessible as, a, as something that people can actually get and perhaps think about translating makes it accessible internationally and a much bigger debate can be had around these things. That was it. Great, Oriana. Um, I'm really sorry, my little electronic hand going up doesn't work. I've been trying very hard and not managing. No, I, I just wanted to pick up on one of the things that, um, uh, that James mentioned, which is how important it is that something does, and Scott as well, that it's not to do with doing this just because somewhere someone is assessing something and giving it a grade. Um, what we because when you go when you think this through in relation to that issue of translation and audiences, you've got to think about who who is the audience for this and who do you want to know about it. So much of the work that gets produced because of its ephemerality, but also the limitation in the type of audience has never communicates across certain types of boundaries. And I think this process we're all involved in searching for answers to uh, for support with is also to do with that expansion of audiences a recognition of the diverse circumstances of audiences and finding a way that we we document things that are important to to us as we uh, as we think as we practice but that is not just for the commissioned moment but is also for expanding that thinking into different territories. I, that seems quite kind of broad, but I, I just felt it was a really important thing to hang on to in relation to what, uh, what, what, what Bambo James and Scott have, have, have referred to. Because, you know, it, it, to see this as an exercise for ref would be soul destroying and pointless. We're talking about something much more radical. And I think that was the, that was sort of the point um, made uh, um, by the uh, at the very beginning of James, uh, the quote from the beginning of James's um, presentation, that we have to be very ambitious. That what we could be doing here is is something that is as transformational as um, some of the other huge changes that we've dealt with over the last two decades. Yeah, that's right, Oriana, and it's the Stephen Hill quote, I think, that you were referring to, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 and yeah. um, that's... Okay, panel, thank you, thank you. We're now going to move the, open the floor to questions, if I may. So, Liam, uh, you've been waiting patiently. May you turn your mic on and ask the question you'd like to of the panel, please? I think you're on mute. <laughs> um, yeah. We can hear you now, Liam, I think. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Really? Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, my thing saying I muted and nothing was changing. So yeah, yeah right, great. You're all good. Fab. Okay. I might find it problem to mute myself again so yeah just tell me if I'm making a noise right <laughs> okay so um yeah really really interesting I'm I work at Hill University I'm a research support librarian and one of the first things I did starting in the job is replacing our our data repository and we picked up something called Figshare um, which is used by Bath Spa for practice research and a, a few other places like Salford as well and um, yeah, one of the reasons we did this was because it's a very good visual showcase um, and it doesn't just do conventional research data. So yeah, um, from my perspective, one of, some of the things that James was talking about right towards the end of his presentation there about things like metrics and kind of available tools that are useful. Um, these these um, FAIR principles, the idea of, of research data, but in a very broad sense being findable or accessible, interoperable and reusable. I, I think they could be useful here if you're kind of building up an infrastructure for um, good practice around sharing practice research. But uh, maybe, maybe it's just me, maybe I'm, maybe I'm ill-informed, I don't know. What do people think? Great, thank you, Liam. Scott, and then other members. Uh, only very briefly to say, yeah, I completely agree. They're really important. We were we were with our library here at University of Leeds. We've been looking at some of these things, and that's right at the centre of what the data management team here are trying to do: is bring those fair principles in and and make that work with practice research. James, uh, they're referenced within the reports um, and are a very good um, guiding principle to be adopted. Um, the other thing I would, I would say is Figshare is a very interesting model um, and there's a broader kind of discussion that's quite complicated around these sorts of things but obviously with Figshare you can also include independent researchers who then have the ability um, and there's there's a lot to think about here in terms of institutional repositories at every individual university all trying to do the same thing and the expense and time expense for the people looking after it doing all of this stuff with practice research which i kind of mentioned within that but um figshare is one of the routes uh, that could work um and and is a very is a very interesting organization in that way and certainly i think they should be part of the dialogue um and shouldn't be excluded just because they're not part of kind of an institutional thing as and such i don't i don't know if it's worth saying but one of the things about um uh, figshare I mean, there's pros and cons for everything, and there are some things that are a bit glitchy that we've been dealing with, but it has potential for quite a lot of additionality um, and customization fixture. So that would also be very useful if we we work collectively with something like fixture, because um, uh, just institutionally, say, the University of the Arts has been in conversation with them to adapt and change to what it wants. Um, it would be good if that was not a unilateral thing, but something that, that we could be sharing across the sector. Brilliant, Liam. Do you want to say anything in response? Are you happy with those answers? I'm happy. Yeah. I would just Great. sort of add that, yeah, we are we are talking to Figshare too among providers. And yeah, I, I find it interesting. They don't have an item type called project. What they call projects is a bunch of items that are kind of held in the backstage and then can be published together and... So their infrastructure kind of misses that one, but I think I'll go over and badger them and say, come on, just make projects as an item type as well. I think it could help some people and it could be more interoperable. So yeah, I'll get on that. Great, thank you very much, Liam. Uh, next hand I can see is Jenny Evans. Jenny, if you can turn your mute button off. Hi, Mark, hopefully, can you hear me? Yes, very well, Jenny. Amazing, thanks. Hi, um, I'm sure some of you on the call are probably well aware of um, the work we've been doing at Westminster in, in this area. And I think um, I just reiterate everything that's been said so far today. We've we've developed uh, our repository uh, to focus not just on uh, individual traditional text-based publications and research data, but also practice research. And so I've, we've certainly been working with colleagues all over the world to try and bring together these different communities because because it is way more than one community. And I've spoken in many different kind of areas. So I think it's very much around how do we get to a point where actually all of the repository systems and CRIS systems out there can, can adopt the standards? And I guess we need to get to a place where the standards reflect uh, what at the moment is called other. Uh, and I know I'm working with 
with colleagues at JESC as well around this to, to try and try and change that conversation so that these research outputs aren't made other. I think the other key thing from my perspective is that we've got a real opportunity here to not make the same mistakes that were made with journals and, and potentially monographs and, and necessarily go down that route where we've got commercial entities owning a lot of this data and, and really how do we make uh, things like statistics uh, and metrics data openly available uh, rather than controlled by specific suppliers. Um, so I think I'll stop there, but I, have, I can share a link to the work we've done if people are interested. I think the answer is yes, Jenny, we'd love to. This is where we're about, you know, working together. So please do share the link in the in the chat, maybe. Uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, I, um, Bambo, I could see, is quite keen to come back, if you would. Oh, Bambo. yeah, just um, partly picking up on the, uh, the big share. Um, we did use that, somebody mentioned Fastball. We use that quite extensively, um, although I give the credit to Miranda Barnes, who's here today and did a lot of work um, on, on that. Um, I think that the most successful example uses of it were those who really used it right from an early stage, rather than um, like I did, I put my work on afterwards and I was using more online technologies, which I did partly because I wanted to reach a wider audience, uh, but also because I had that slight nervousness about sharing everything initially. Um, but having gone through that process, I think next time round, I, I do want to be more to be using that um, earlier on and putting on um, researchers and nurses and data as a focus right from the beginning. Um, but if Miranda did want to say anything, I think she's she's a real expert in that in that area. Brilliant. Well, we'd love to hear from Miranda if if you feel comfortable. Uh, Scott. Oh, well. uh, yeah, I, I can I can chip in a little bit. I've just got to figure out why my um, video doesn't appear to be working, but. Um, I can sort of begin talking while I figure that out. Um, so we submitted, um, I think, 104 uh, what we called e-portfolios internally, uh, but were called uh, single or multi-component outputs with contextualizing information <laughs> in RefLingo, but we thought that was a bit long. Um, but the collection function is what we used on, on Figshare, um, which allowed each of those collections to be assigned a DOI. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll put, I did have a, a spreadsheet made um, of those, if anybody's interested in browsing through them, that link's in the chat. Um, and it was, it was really an interesting process working through the different conundrums that the different areas of research raised um, and how we documented that. And there was a lot of work that went into making sure that the majority of them could be fully open access. And I think um, approximately 60% um, were fully open access and 40% were um, actually uh, somewhat closed, but none of them were fully closed, um, I think, except for um, metadata, except for maybe a small handful. Anyway, hello, <laughs> I finally got my camera working. Um, but I think that allowing so much of it to be shared and I think there was a there was an ambition from the beginning to avoid that ref graveyard to prevent it from all of this work from just going into a you know a, a locked file cabinet or a bin somewhere because we we wanted to enhance the profile of creative practice research as research um, and I think being allowing it to be shared more widely really was um, a goal there anyway uh, if anyone has any questions do feel free to get in touch with me I don't want to monopolize. Great, Miranda. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I've got Scott waiting, then Oriana next. Thanks. I wanted to come back to two points um, from from what Jenny said. The one one is just about the, that idea of avoiding the avoiding the problems that happened with journals and monographs, where it all fell into corporate ownership that at, at least perhaps with practice research because artists have such a track record of it, trying to stand up for their own copyrights and their own rights that as much as copyright is a broken system there's I think there's room there to hopefully avoid that same kind of thing happen but the thing I really wanted to ask you was and I'm, I'm assuming you're the same Jenny Evans who's quoted in the in the bully Shan report but talking about publishers and, and the publisher field is this is a really interesting thing in music because of course 90 1995, the vast majority of composers 
writing to ref are self-published or at best working with small bespoke publishing sites. So when I put something into, and this may be getting into the weeds a little, but when I put something into our institutional um, data management system, when I put a piece in, I put myself in as the publisher because I am the publisher, but this is probably completely inconsistent across the system. So I'd be interested in any sort of thing you could say about that. Would you mind, Jenny? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, sure. I think, to be honest, it's actually a really good question. I think what it also point, highlights is some of the nuances around standards such as data sites. So to mint a DOI, you as the institution have to be the publisher. So if you're not the publisher, strictly speaking, you shouldn't be minting the DOI. Now, obviously, there are allowances there, but actually what's not really caught up is the guidance. So I think, I mean, I think part of it's around who who kind of owns that content. And this is obviously where those copyright and IP challenges come in as well. Um, so I think it it kind of depends on what you as the creator kind of have the right to, to kind of sign off, if that makes sense. So if you've published with a small kind of music producing production company or publisher, and but you know that you've got an agreement that says you can publish this, and we, we can mint that day while that work and that, that's why is so multifaceted because it, it's not simply about taking a, a piece of work and publishing it it's about factoring in all of the different players uh and and those with a stake in a piece of research but personally that's why i find it so interesting so i'm not sure that's answered your question scott but it, it's definitely something we've been thinking about and and we really need to work on in as a community i think Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, I've got Oriana, then I've got James. Um, it, it, it struck me from uh, uh, something we were just talking about that we also have to recognize there's a, there's a generational moment where we have so many students who've done PhDs that include practice research starting to come through who, who look to their supervisory team and very often that supervisory team doesn't have the same experience in the documentation of their own practice you know that they can be very helpful in helping support the development of of, of processes and methods and, and and of what the work should be like but they can't they don't offer role models in the way that for a text-based PhD student, they can look to the written work of their supervisor and think, oh yeah, well, I, I understand why they've done that. I can I can take something from that. And I, I think that generational moment is going to start to shift quite a lot. The more that our practice uh, PhD students enter into the profession and become part of the, 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 the teaching teams, the more we're going to see a greater rigor emerging um, in the demands being made of, of, of practice. But we ought to sort of jump ahead from that moment and recognize we can't be expecting it to work for one group of people and not be expecting it to be happening um, across the board, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you, Oriana. James? Um, that is such an, a crucial, crucial point. And it often, in a way, people often forget how how important PhD supervisors are, but also how much incredible uh, good practice within practice research is coming out of the new generations of PhD students. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really worth looking at that actually, because there's amazing innovation coming from that generation um, with all of this stuff. Um, so I just wanted to mention something very specific and slightly more kind of technical uh, related to scores. Um, so I just published an open access archive of a music journal called Contact Online, which was published in the 70s and 80s. And part of that process involved paying small amounts of money to independent music publishers to make scores available. And th this has precedent within research publication in other fields with um, APCs, article processing charges, to make things available open access. And the same thing could easily happen here. Um, in terms of making scores available. So that's something that I think is an institutional question about making that money available um, to support practice researchers. And that kind of gets rolled into institutional support, I would say. Um, and then on a secondary level, I would, I would just really advocate a bit of caution around getting too worried about copyright. Because actually, the vast majority of the time when I talk to people about copyright and practice research, 
they they get very caught up on publishing the full amount of the end product which is sort of what scott was talking about earlier like i've got to make the whole end product available say for me i've got to make the whole 40 minutes of this bbc proms performance available as a video a lot of the time 99 percent of the time that is not appropriate for a research output and it's not fair on your audience in terms of those people accessing it and really a lot of the time they're they're looking to your research narrative so you could probably quote that five percent and it would work well and you would not need to worry about copyright and i'd really just think very carefully about that before it's something that people get very caught up and upset about um, and often doesn't need to be that much of a concern it's not that scary that's very good james um just i'm going to bring you in to end 10 seconds scott but i'm going to ask the panelists to start thinking about some concluding thoughts um, you know, particularly in the spirit of what Mark has said, how we continue to learn from each other and perhaps, you know, how we as a community can have the kind of impact that Stephen Hill talked about that Oriana mentioned as, um, in, uh, in a comment a couple of times, uh, 20 minutes ago or so. Uh, but before I do that, uh, Scott, and then maybe there's time for one more question from the floor. Just briefly to completely agree with James and about copyright. And I, I think, I mean, it's something I, I stand up on a soapbox about all the time, but I think the real issue perhaps is that we as a community and by, by which I mean academics and research support and libraries, etc., and especially ref teams within universities don't necessarily understand this and would, it would really be of benefit to see more clear examples of this kind of thing and how it, how it can play out and where, where people should be worried and where people should be careful. But I can agree about not fixating on submitting the full thing that usually a narrative is what does the job terrific thank you scott so i'm going to give it 10 seconds for any remaining question no matter how small or big and then i think just in the order that we heard the panelists we some some just reflections um particularly if they've developed over the last couple of hours on how we might continue to work together Okay, brilliant. So we are then going to move to that, uh, the, this final uh, part of the two hour session. So I'm going to start, if I may, Oriana with you. Um, this, the, what I always need is for people to come together in a clearer way about the um, ways in which different technologies are appropriate or inappropriate because I think you have a lot of people who understand the problem and a lot of people who can articulate how to solve the problem but those people don't always speak to each other and I, I, I recognize what Bambo said of uh, I've had a huge amount of um, help and support from working with um, our institutional repository manager uh, and, by, and by talking to people at JISC but I don't, and, and I mean, Mark's much better at all this because he understands a bit about some of the technological implications, but I think what you do have across uh, this subject is a divide between people who understand the problem and people who can see their way through to what would be a technical solution for elements of the problem, uh, getting together enough times to, to, to find something that is a coherent path because it, you know, like one meeting doesn't do it, does it? And it, it, it's, it's, it's getting the, 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 the interface between technical solution and um, theoretical problems, uh, probably pro properly integrated with enough empowerment from institutional governmental resources to, to lead to change. I think that's right, Oriana, and my, you know, um, and there's so much here about the kind of how you design systems through the users working with the technologists in order to have something which actually marries in with the processes that people want to enact. So, you know, that's a, it is a huge amount of work, but uh, yeah, well said. Um, Oriana, thank you very much indeed. Bam, if I may move on to you. Um, yeah, I think in terms of the final bits of the com conversation uh, that struck me. Um, I think the point about PhD students was really important. I, th I think there's a lot of opportunity for cross fertilization. Sometimes I think the PhD students are way ahead of us. Um, and then suddenly we, we take a, back a backward step when it comes to researching as, as um, sort of supposed professional researchers. 
Um, but likewise as well, in spite of um, some of the criticisms for the ref, I think there's some really good practice in there that could be brought into PhDs. Like for instance, just having a very short um, 500 word statement and then a portfolio of work, which in a lot of institutions still isn't allowed for PhDs. So I think there's some, some opportunities for, for cross learning there. Um, and then just to reiterate my point about care, because I think that's really important. And I think it goes beyond ethics because ethics themselves can be a tick box exercise, but I think any work in terms of looking at the, you know, the visibility of research really needs to integrate care into the, how we think about it and into the research and development process as well. Terrific, thank you very much, Bambo. Um, I'm getting the order right now, Scott, please. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to echo exactly what Bambo just said about about ethics. There is always that tick box danger. I think having these as I, I think having the conversations about giving people the empowerment to know what questions to ask and how to think about what they're doing is is really needed. But yes, definitely avoiding a tick box solution to that. But I also wanted to briefly just go back to what Oriana said a moment ago about empowerment and connect that up to the cultural shift, because I think there is on the side of the technical solutions, there is an empowerment that can be made there if something and I strongly support this idea again of a, a, li a practice library that people can can contribute to, but aligning that with the cultural shift that makes researchers want to create things for other research as well as art for their respective artistic audiences, that it's not an either or situation. You don't make academic music or real music for the world, or academic art or real art, that everything we make has audiences both in specialists who want to understand how they can build on it or how they can add to it or etc., and also people who enjoy it for its own sake and that the technical solution hopefully will create that slippery slopes that allows the cultural shift to get makers and academics and researchers on board with that a bit more easily. Um, I think that's perfectly put. If I were you, Scott, I'd actually go back and work out what you said, write it down and get it into the ethosid. That sounded a, a perfect su summary of what we need to do. If I may, James, move on to you. I'd echo all of that and I think the, the kind of final final step in this is that it's very clear that um, a huge amount of people understand the problems and um, lots of people understand uh, potential solutions and that work now needs to be done. I don't think, um, you know, in some ways we it's possible to discuss these things endlessly and speculate and that's probably been an issue for the last 15 or 20 years. But actually, um, I think, you know, publish things in response to these reports that Osden and I wrote, critique them, take sections of them, advance them, use them to do different things um, and, and, and move on. That, that's really what I feel about it. I feel like it's this brilliant point to, to move forward now. And, uh, you know, a huge community um, has arisen around this who are very supportive and very knowledgeable and willing to push this forward. So I think it's now about taking advantage of that and actually in a kind of quite structured way moving forward. And, and you know, pub, I, I do think publish, write about this stuff so that people can access that, argue with it and move on. And that's my, that's my big thing. Thank you so much, James. Scott, did you just want to come back on that? Only just a tiny thing I forgot to mention that speaking exactly of making these things happen and these group of people coming together, AHRC recently, as I just stuck in the chat, had a scoping future data services funding call, which was quite late in the cycle. And it's it's something that we need to see more of, though. Um, I'm sure various institutions have applied for this. and It would be great to see the future data services have the funding to properly think about these kind of infrastructures. But I think we need to see more of this because this has to be, as several people have said, this has to be at least a national, if not an international level thing. One university here or there isn't going to be able to solve this. It definitely needs people coming together, which means national level institutional support from UK or I, etc. So I just wanted to flag that that did happen, but would, more would be good. Uh, Mark, you have muted yourself. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, I'm glad that was you, Will. That was very quick on the draw, by the way. Um, uh, can I ask, is, is this the full recording of this going to be available? Can I ask, um, I'm not sure if Marcus is still with us. Will, is that the plan? 
Yeah, the recording will be sent out to everyone that registered uh, within a week, and then it will also be public on the UKRN YouTube. I think that's brilliant. I, ha I have to say, I thoroughly enjoyed that two hours. Uh, and I would say that wouldn't like as I was chair, but I learned a huge amount and I'm incredibly grateful to panelists for giving up two hours of their time. Thank you very much, Oriana. Thank you very much, Bambo. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, James. And may I thank Lauren, who is somewhere up in the air uh, right now as we speak. But I'd also like to thank, um, if I may, Marcus and Will, who have made this very easy for us, you know, coming to us in the first place. Uh, and you've given us your support and to my friend and colleague Maria Delgado, who, who is amongst us, who is one of the co-founders of Prague, also a co-supervisor of the project that, that James and Oz have been working on. Uh, and, um, and, and Maria, your input is always extremely valuable all of the time. So thank you. Uh, and I think that's it, um, really, just to thank everybody as well for being part of this and giving up your time. And, and may we continue, in the words of Marcus, to, to learn, to continue to learn from each other about best that we can move this field forward. Thank you very much. Anything else to say, Will or Marcus? Just to echo that, I, I think it's been great. I found it absolutely fascinating. And, um, you know, I think it, it's an example of how, as you say, we can learn from each other and also just how much more we have in common that we might first think. And um, yeah. and I think we can, we can do something uh, really uh, important with this. Great. Um, and I will just chime in to encourage people to visit the UKRN website. Uh, if you search UKRN, we are now at the top of the search. It's very exciting. Um, also, follow us on Twitter, which is at UK Repro, um, and you can subscribe to a quarterly newsletter. That's it, folks. Thank you very much indeed. Have a pleasant afternoon and evening. <laughs>